All right. I am uh, blessed, lucky some might say, but I'm blessed to have an old friend come back and have a conversation with me. I wanted to have a conversation two-way, but after looking at his book and, and how much is in it and the message that he has, I thought, you know, people know my story. They know where I'm at. I want to support what he's done because two reasons. One, mine's personal experience. I go on, people go, yeah, he's an Irishman, he talks. This is a man, Mark Gober, who researches every book that he's done. You could go through there and he's got somebody quoted from Princeton and Harvard and, you know, and science and Nobel Prize people. I mean, it's not his opinion. It's a educated presentation. It's a dissertation. It's a, a baptism of truth. And this man presents it well. I, I first, Mark, I think I first met you uh, at my doorstep about five years ago, four years ago, something like that. I, I usually, I, I live uh, about an hour and a half, two hours from the San Francisco Bay Area. And periodically on Saturdays, I'll hear some noise outside and I come to the door and there's three, four, five, 10, 15 people out there. They'll come up, oh, I just wanted to meet you. So anyway, but you came up with a group. Uh, it was a great experience. You presented me with a copy of your first book, which was on consciousness, the end to upside down, thinking, I believe was the title. And that impressed me. And, and so I, I've been a fan ever since. Then you did the, the three more. This is your third one after that, I believe. The book we're going to talk about today, which I think is, the consciousness book, it's hard to say it's better than that. It's different. Consciousness book was an awakening for in, intelligent people. And, uh, and I say that because there's people out there you're never going to awaken. You can't shake them loose. They're in a coma. Uh, but this book, an end to upside down contact, UFOs, aliens, and spirits, and why their ongoing interaction with human civilization matters. A lot in that title. That's why we want to get right to it. Mark, just as a brief introduction, uh, you graduated at the top of your class in, at Princeton. You were in banking, financing, you were in Silicon Valley doing great things. You had your company and, and you were involved in a lot of stuff. You were doing well on the material level. And then you got kind of involved with that ultimate question, why? Why am I here? Yeah. What's consciousness? What does this mean? So that inquisitiveness has led to this book. And people have to know this is like a, no one knew you probably did a year of research before you did this. And, and just as a, before I go off on this thing and turn the show over to you, people got to realize you're not some wacko kook. You're not wearing a tinfoil hat. You're presenting things in, in a scientific, logical uh, manner, which a lot of the stuff can be gone back to references and things. So this is not just off the top of your head. This is stuff that's well-founded. And so I'm going to kind of turn this over to you, Mark, if you, if you kind of give us a brief whatever you want to start off with the introduction. But before you start, because I know you probably won't because you're, you're into just the issues, but I think the synopsis from your book that your publisher wrote really says a lot about what, where we're going to go on this journey. And basically the synopsis goes, are we alone? The answer, according to Mark Gober, End to upside down contact is a resolution, resolution. No, humans exist among a variety of advanced species, sometimes identified as aliens, spirits, beings of light, and beyond. In fact, our civilization seems to be regularly influenced by such non human intelligence, even if we're not always aware of it. Near death experiences and other phenomena of consciousness reveal that some species exist in other dimensions that our eyes cannot ordinarily see. Similarity, UFOs, alien abductions, which were examined by former head of psychiatry at Harvard, which I'm sure you're gonna tell us about, provide additional advice and evidence that we're not alone. As strange as this might sound, none of this is new. Contact with non-human intelligence is likely a part of humanity's ancient history. This isn't just some fringe phenomena either. We seem to exist within a multi-species, multi-dimensional battle between good and evil and our futures of civilizations at stake. 
well, buckle up for a wild and paradigm shifting ride. That opens up curiosity at so many levels. Start anywhere you want. I'm sure it's going to bring up a thousand questions when people watch this. Well, first of all, Rev Bill, I want to say thank you for inviting me back on the show. I always love talking to you and I have appreciated your support and guidance throughout my journey. And I, I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Um, so my, my journey on this topic of contact, I could say it started when I began my, if you want to call it a spiritual awakening in 2016, when I was first listening to podcasts, reading books, one of the topics that came up very often was the idea that humans are not alone. And sometimes it came up in the context of people who were psychic and they communicated with these other beings or they did channeling or other people who said, I had a, an encounter with a UFO, a whole wide range of phenomena. So this has been on my radar for a while, uh, but I don't know how these things happen. Earlier uh, this year in 2022, I got the hit that I needed to go really deep in this topic, even more than I had over the last several years, and then decided to write this, this book. Um, but before we get into the, the details of it, and I think this is an important message, especially for your audience that's very spiritually in tune, I would say, is that my hesitation with the topic is that it's, it can seem very glamorous. Oh, wow, they're, they're aliens. There are these amazing creatures out there. And that is very interesting, but it can be a distraction from the spiritual path. And the discussion that we had several years ago about my second book and into Upside Down Living Many of those topics to me are still at the very top of my priority list individually that we're trying to evolve our individual consciousness. So I've had to ask myself, well, why would we even, why even look at these topics? And I do th still think it's important, even though we have to just be aware of the potential distraction. It's important because I think we need to be aware of our surroundings in the same way that if you live in a town, you need to know where the various, uh, where the good neighborhoods are, where the dangerous neighborhoods are. It's just part of our reality. And I look at it that way, of just trying to understand the truth of reality. And I, I wanted to set that stage because we're gonna talk about some pretty wild things. Um, I call the book an end to upside down contact. Well, first of all, my books all start with an end to upside down. So there's a, a common theme there. But I do think the way that we, we approach contact as a society is upside down in a variety of ways. And the most obvious, of ways is that our mainstream consensus reality thinks that there is no contact with non-human intelligence, that human beings are the top of the food chain, and that's kind of it. Um, so that's one way in which it's upside down. But for those who do accept contact, I found that there are misconceptions about it, and there are a number of them. One relates to my, my previous work on the nature of consciousness. This idea that if we think about UFOs in particular, there are many people who want to study the nature of the crafts and the types of maneuvers that they can do and the type of energy they must use. Those are all very important features. But when you dig into the phenomenon, it, it's very apparent that it's not purely physical. There's a physical aspect to it, but there's something that's multidimensional, something in the realm of consciousness. And if you miss that, it's like you're missing the big picture with, with UFOs and everything beyond that. And therefore, for me, especially given that I started with this consciousness topic and things like near-death experiences, there is, to me, a spectrum of types of contact encounters. UFOs, that's one type, but then there's a whole category of what I call non-UFO encounters, and I have a whole chapter on that in the book. That would be something like a near-death experience, where a person's, they're clinically, for example, and they encounter a being of light or they encounter deceased relatives, for example. We also see this in what's known as shared death experiences. And these are, this is a pretty mind-blowing phenomenon because the near-death experience is when a person is in this state where they're basically dead and the skeptics want to say, well, it's because uh, th their brain had some kind of residual functioning that created a hallucination. And it's a, an evolutionary mechanism to make you feel better about death or something like that people will come up with. Um, there's a lot of reasons to counter that which as you know, Rev Bill, from your own experiences, but also Dr. Bruce Grayson from the University of Virginia and many others. But these shared death experiences are felt by people who are not having any trauma to their body. They are bystanders in the room, sometimes family members who live, they co-live the dying experience with the person who's actually dying. And they report very similar things, including encountering these types of beings. Um, 
deathbed visions. It's a similar related phenomenon. A person is near the time of death and they very often describe this, hospice workers validate it as well, that they see or encounter other intelligent beings that appear to be multidimensional. So when we look at these other phenomena of consciousness, I mean, channeling is another one where scientifically there are Helene Wabe from the Institute of Noetic Sciences has researched it. A person seems to embody a, an external spirit that something is going on there um, in remote viewing where people perceive something with their mind at a distance. Sometimes they encounter these types of beings in past life research. You know, there there's different ways we can look at past lives because at one level, there's one consciousness, no time, there is no past. So it's sort of a construct, but people do have these memories of, of being on in other civilizations in other types of bodies. So that's just another interesting, you know, data point that we see. I, I cite a woman named Dr. Linda Bachman who helps people with hypnosis and her clients spontaneously described being in these other civilizations in the past. Uh, but we also see it in what's known as the between lives area. And this was studied at the University of Virginia. Uh, Dr. Ian Stevenson who passed away, but also Dr. Jim Tucker who studies children who have past life memories. Now I've talked about that in my previous books, but I also in, in some of the books mentioned this idea of a between lives segment that the children report. So they died in the past life, but then there was this period before the next life that they are remembering. And in that period, they talk about other beings that seem to be guiding the process. So I, I mention all these different areas because the analogy I use in my book is a Venn diagram. If I, st I, I don't want to stake my case on one individual anecdotal report, but when you look at a lot of reports, you see an overlap. And that's what I'm focused on is that I can't deny all of them together. Maybe some of these cases will pr be proven false at some point, but the, the accumulation of the evidence to me is what's so powerful and the implications, you know, all you need is one of these to be real. And then it means we have to rethink our consensus reality. I mean, for me, for the last six years, it has meant a complete revamping of how I look at life and what my priorities are, eventually leaving my Silicon Valley job, which I spent 10 years, ultimately became a partner and decided I wanted to pursue these other things. And that's why I feel so compelled to write about this material and talk about it. Wow. That's got me thinking. Now, you know, I'm not a skeptic at all, having, and you know me a little, and you believe you read my autobiography where I talk about my alien abduction, uh, amongst other things. Uh, so let's let's get down to this because a lot of people, UFOs. Let's just take UFOs. There's, there's reports on sightings. There's report on people being abducted. Let's focus a little energy there. Let's. What's the truth on this? What does the government know? What do we know? What's the accepted? belief system. I noticed, as I say that, I, I, I cut an article out about 15 years ago from the newspaper because it was an article that was just on the back, back pages of the newspaper that the Catholic Church says there's life on another planet. There may exist another species out there. And then that was buried. I, I mean, I saw one time in a paper and I had to cut it out because I said, this is good. And it never got any coverage. But let's go there. Let's Let's talk about aliens, alien abduction, UFOs. Sure. Well, in the book, I do, I divide it, like I said, into non-UFO contact and then also UFO related contact. And that's a big section of the book. And that's something I, I didn't cover in my previous book. So it's new for me as well. But looking at the history of UFOs and, and reported sightings, first of all, they go back in ancient history. There's a great book by Jacques Vallée and Chris Aubeck that track from ancient times, Pharaoh Akhenaten, for example, the book of Ezekiel, there are these descriptions of very supernatural events of flying things in the sky, lights in the sky, creatures. In the, in the book of Ezekiel's account, he talks about these creatures um, that were associated with this, whatever it was. It seems like a, a saucer or some kind of a craft. And the challenge in this process, looking at it historically, is that people used different language to describe these things. And we have different technology today, so we use our own bias to describe them, but you can sort of correlate what they were saying and say, oh, wow, this is very similar to what many people are reporting. So I wanna start with that because, and I do have a segment in my book on these ancient encounters, and that's important because this doesn't seem to be new. But if we look more in modern times, what these when these accounts started, uh, there's a historian named Richard Dolan, who's done a really good job academically of 
historian looking at the history of UFOs. He has some amazing books just going through it like a historian would for other topics. It's, it's just rare to see that in the UFO space. And he chronicles these various cases of people having reported sightings. I mean, the challenge is that in many cases, especially back in the late 1800s, for example, um, there were some cases and that was before the flying technology that we have today. So those are particularly compelling. But how can we confirm them? Uh, we don't have picture evidence in many cases. So it's it's difficult to, to say with certainty. Um, again, for me, the, the strength is in the accumulation of all the data that there are so many of these reports that people have encountered. And what I do in the book is just go through case after case and what has been described and what the witnesses said. We saw a pickup in the UFO reports around the World War II era, which is also when we saw a proliferation in, in technology that would enable those things. So the, the complication here is that some of the reports might not be real alien technology. Maybe they're just advanced government technology, or maybe it's just a, a visual illusion based on the atmosphere. There are lots of explanations in some cases, but the point is not, are, can some of them be debunked? Because if you just have a few that are advanced technology from another civilization. That's what seems to be important. Um, so I think we probably have both starting in the World War II era. And also another important factor that I, I continue to ponder, I don't really know what the truth is on all this, is the idea that around the time of the nuclear bomb, we started to see more of these alien technologies enter. And the theory is that these beings have an interest in us not using nuclear weapons. And one of the cases that I cite is from a man named Philip Corso Jr. His father, who's now deceased, alleges to have been involved in the uh, post-Roswell UFO cra crash. And that was a crash in 1947. There's lots of debate about whether it was a, some kind of a balloon or an alien craft. This man, Philip Corso, claims that it was a UFO craft, alien technology, and those technologies he worked on with the government to then bring the technologies out to the public. So that he claims he was in a secret government program. Then he wrote a book about all this called The Day After Roswell, 1997. Right before he died, he wrote, disclosing all the stuff that he was involved in. He, he saw an alien body, described it in detail, he claims. And there's lots of debate about this. But his son says that his father spoke with Edward Teller, who was involved in the nuclear bomb. And what Teller told his father was that the nuclear explosions impact other dimensions. So his father's opinion was that these beings, these alien beings were negatively affected by the nuclear explosions for some multidimensional reason. And therefore they wanted to start coming to earth to intervene and make sure that we didn't do that anymore for their own benefit. And in fact, there is a researcher named Robert Hastings who wrote this unbelievable several hundred page book examining cases of UFO sightings at nuclear weapons facilities, because they seem to appear more often there, amazingly. So he's interviewed many people that were at these facilities, and they describe remarkable things, <laughs> like the nukes were being disarmed when these, when these uh, crafts were around. And in other cases, the nukes were activated, apparently by these crafts, and then deactivated, which scared them, clearly. So I mention all this because that they seem to be intervening and they have an interest in, uh, in what we're doing. And they, I mean, not all of the, the UFO sightings appear at nuclear weapons facilities. There are many of those cases, but there are also other cases too. There, there's one that I mentioned called the Phoenix Lights, where many, many people saw these in, in Phoenix. And there's a great documentary uh, on this topic. And there is some photographic evidence of the formation of those lights. Um, so there's lots of these reported sightings, number one. And then to your, your topic about uh, abductions, which is related to the UFO phenomenon, but sometimes we don't always see the craft in, in, as, is in as explicit of a manner, even though it seems to be related. Abductions is a, a big focus of my book, and it's a big focus of my mental uh, energy right now, because I'm trying to understand what's going on with them. The idea is that, and what's reported commonly. So what I'm saying here is what I've never experienced this personally, at least not that I consciously remember. And I give that caveat because what's often reported is missing time where people, they might see a light outside their window and then they wake up the next morning, they're exhausted. They don't remember what happened. Uh, so there's an ability to alter memory. And there's also a phenomenon that we've communicated about known as screen memories, where a person, for example, might 
say that they saw an owl. Sometimes it's a raccoon. There are various animals. Deer is another common one. And they went over to, to see the owl. They stopped their car and then they drove home. And maybe there was missing time. They got home and it's like two hours later than they thought it should have been. What is revealed sometimes when people go under hypnosis and hypnosis is a process which is not always reliable, but it can be a way to unlock memories. And this was studied, you mentioned uh, the Harvard psychiatrist. I, I reference him often in my book, Dr. John Mack. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, head of the psychiatry department at Harvard. He passed away in 2004, who was presented with these cases of people claiming they had alien abductions. And he concluded that they were not psychotic. Um, but I mentioned him here. We'll talk about him more later because he used hypnosis to help people unlock some of these memories. And he thought sometimes it was credible. Now, going back to the screen memories, people, when they're under hypnosis, they might, the, the hypnotherapist will say, well, can you describe the owl for me that you saw? They'll start describing it and they'll end up describing not an owl, but a gray alien. And they'll say this way, this isn't an owl. Uh, so it might be that these memories are somehow implanted so that the person has a different type of experience that they recall. And going back to John Mack, this is a case I reference in my book of one of the cases he examined. He would ask people about their memories before hypnosis and they would, he would do a whole case study on it. He has a book called Abduction and it's very academic. He's a, he was a psychiatrist and he goes through exactly what they were saying. And then he takes them under a hypnotic journey and they describe something that's usually very different than the pre-hypnosis memories or their different details that emerge. One of the cases I, I referenced was um, a man who claims he had an encounter as a teenager. And what he remembers was being taken into a pod and he thought he had a direct sexual encounter with a female alien. That's what his memory was before hypnosis. And again, this is very common. There's something about sexual reproduction that we'll talk about. I don't fully understand it, but it comes up very often. When he went, underwent hypnosis, his memory was different. He was taken into what seemed like a, a surgery room, some kind of an operating room, very often commonly reported. And he had what appeared to be a essentially a semen extraction, but it wasn't through a, a sexual encounter. It was almost it was like a machine that induced this. And we also hear this with females where the, the eggs are, are taken and sometimes there's an artificial insemination. But the point about memory here, which is a really important one and one that makes it difficult as a researcher to know what's going on, is that we see differences in the pre-hypnosis memories versus the hypnosis memories. And what are we to believe? How is it that these beings are, seem to be able to do this to us, to alter our memory? And what, what's true versus what's What's not true? I'll pause there because I just said a lot. I'd love to hear your reaction. No, because I think when people have an encounter, there's a fear element. Fear itself wipes memory and it doesn't give you clear thinking. You're not analytical. I mean, like if you had an encounter and you were totally calm, you could analyze it and everything. But when somebody's fearful, you kind of shut down functions. Um, no, I, I, I believe in this missing time thing. And, you know, and I, I talked about several events in my life um and what's interesting when my two sisters and i had an encounter and we saw these you know almond shaped eyes you know and the small people and and uh we had it happen one night and it, at nine o'clock at night and we were frightened and everything and next thing you know it's sunlight the sun's coming up we're in the front room going how'd we get here and there's three beans in front of us. And, and then we get this gesture that was like a goodbye, calm down, you're all right, we love you kind of thing. But uh, my sisters were angry. They felt like they were, you know, was, was something wasn't right. That happened that in 1950, right about there. We never, ever had a conversation about it until 2000 and something. Or 50 years expired, and we never said a word. And then when we brought it up, I brought it up, and I don't think my sisters wanted to really talk about it, but it was like, how can we have something like this happen, an experience with three people, and never talk about it? Mm. Interesting phenomenon. Anyway, as you were saying. Well, you're reminding me of a phenomenon that I write about, and I wonder if it impacted your personal experience. The phenomenon is known as uh, being switched off. That's the terminology they use, switched off, where 
and I, I mentioned some cases of this in the book where the, the, let's say the UFO appears and the person sees the UFO and doesn't think to take out his camera or do anything. It's like there is a, a manipulation of consciousness that inhibits normal behavior. Right. And I wonder if that is what was involved, that you just didn't even think to talk about it for some reason. Yeah, when it was like, that was the only encounter, but that's the one I had. It's nice when you have an encounter when there's two other people involved. There's three mm -hmm. people. You got to witness to what happened. Different story. But I had something, and I don't know if you write about this or even it got exposed to us. I've had a couple of counters with a sphere in, in my meditation. It's big, like blinding light sphere, and you know, and mind goes blank. You just feel love. You feel peace. It's just, and it goes off for a period of time and then explodes like glass and shards of light into your heart. What was interesting, it had to be in, in Oakland, California. And then about 20 years later, I go, I'm going to write about that experience. What do I remember? And I started trying to remember, and I said, and then I couldn't remember everything. And I said, well, next time that happens, I'm going to ask these questions. And I wrote down on my computer, I wrote down all these questions I was going to ask logically of, of this intelligence, whatever it was. And I was going to observe and do all that. And as soon as I finished typing it, I'm sitting at my computer, and there on my ceiling is this sphere. Anyway, time goes by, God knows how much or how little. I didn't ask what I just wrote the questions. I didn't ask one question. I didn't have one analysis. I didn't try to get any information. I just, and it was over. It was like, same experience. I, I'm just going to be smart this time. I'm going to ask. And as soon as I had that formulated, that thought process and wanted to recall that so I could write about it, it came back. And I'm looking at that. And I'm thinking that had to be some kind of intelligence. There was a consciousness there. There was something there. Uh, interdimensional. Whatever it was, I, I leave it to the critics, but just that's a little different type thing. You know, you, you already planned when this happened. I planned this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to it didn't happen. Huh. Yeah, it's, it sounds similar to what I've researched. And I have heard these cases of a spherical, people call it an orb sometimes. And I have heard this idea of an exploding orb that yeah. it, it bursts yeah. into pieces of light. So it's, it's amazing how there are similarities of independent accounts and it seems to be intelligent. That's what people re repeatedly say. Now, this is getting to one of the big challenges that I, I have. And I think all researchers in this domain have is trying to identify these species because they seem to have an ability, like for who is they? Are there different species or is it one species that is able to shift its form depending on the person that is being encountered? We know that if, if we believe in screen memories, they can make themselves appear to be like an owl, at least in our memory, for example, things like that. But I do talk about this notion of shape shifting because it comes up so often in the research. Dr. John Mack from Harvard, he wrote in his book, he said the aliens appear to be consummate shape shifters. <laughs> Harvard psychiatrist saying this, uh, and it's often reported. And I, I actually do mention cases of women who claimed they were having sexual encounters with these beings, which again is very often reported. And the beings, the face was, was changing where it would be a human face that appeared appealing to them based on what they would find attractive. And then it would switch to some, one of them was describing it as a reptilian type being, which comes up often. Another was describing it as a gray alien type being. And then in one of the cases I'm remembering, the minute she, it was becoming too scary, it was shifting back to what looked like a human. And going back to your, your case with the orbs, what, what is that? Was it appearing just, was it one of those other beings appearing in a different type of form? Is it a different species? I don't know. It's, and then there's a part of me, it just says it's all, it's all one. It's all one consciousness. Yeah. Whether it's materialization in the material world or it's in these other worlds, whatever they may be. Ultimately, I believe there's only one. One what? One everything. It's one. There's nothing outside of yourself. It's it's all internal game, right? So even these other interdimensionals, everything's within you. Uh, that's my concept. I don't know if you wrote about that at all, but uh, I, I believe as you do, uh, when you look back at history, you don't have to go too far back. I had a friend that died three or four years ago. He was a World War II navigator bomber uh, flying over Germany and Yugoslavia and these places. And they were getting attacked and all kinds of stuff. They were in great danger. Everything was blowing up, airplanes going down. And he had these lights all around his aircraft. You know, 
and they called them Foo Fighters. And uh, it was a phenomenal World War II, which I didn't hear about until I really talked to him. And later on, that was in the book, uh, God in the Trenches. He actually talked about the light. He never said the word Foo Fighters, but that's what he told me. He says, yeah, they were like Foo Fighters, whatever that is. That was kind of like the nickname they gave, gave him, you know. And they got made fun of and everything. But it happened to not just his crew. It happened to all kinds of crews. When it came, he got great peace of mind. He felt he got protected. He didn't get shot down. But these lights were all around him. They thought the Germans had a secret weapon. Germans thought the Americans were doing something. But I don't know if you talk about Foo Fighters in your book. Do you? Do you? Yeah, I mentioned them because they were so often reported in that era. And people, there's still a mystery as to what they were. It's crazy. But I, but I think, I think you've, you've hit on something since the atomic age. Uh, we've opened up something, and, and the thought process you got out there, this may be messing up interdimensionally, since I believe in one, everything's there's one place, there's one time, there's everything's here. Therefore, yeah, it probably is yeah. at, at some level doing something. But it's really interesting that I'm 76 years old. The war was 70. We dropped the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki 77 years ago. In 77 years, we've never used that atomic force on any city ever. That's like a miracle. We have right. the weapon. All these countries got the weapon, and yet nobody, nobody's ever dropped it again. Kind of makes you wonder if there's an influence out there that's influencing things. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm much more open to that than I used to be because what commonly comes up in all these reports is that these beings are intervening in our world. Somehow, whether it's just telepathically influencing our behavior or in the case of Robert Hastings' research looking at nuclear weapons facilities, these crafts are directly influencing the nuclear weapons themselves. Uh, just amazing reports. Um, and I also want to go back to what you said about the oneness. It is something I talk about in this book, and it's, it's an important paradox to keep in mind. Um, because the appearance is of separation of, of there's Mark and there's Bill here and there's we're all individuals. So that's what we perceive with our eyes. So at some level that separation exists because it's part of our perception. I think the ultimate reality, I agree with you, is the oneness. And therefore, our behavior will naturally impact these other beings because at some level they are us and we are them. And I do talk about that. So they it would make sense for them to have an interest. But the interest, this is also important, is is sometimes benevolent and sometimes not so benevolent. It seems there seems to be a spectrum of types of beings. Now, again, this is a paradox because at one level, and we learn this from near-death experiences and other types of mystical experiences, we live in a field of unconditional love. To me, that's how I look at life. We're part of that field. But that unconditional love can be obscured or blocked. The rays of the sun can have clouds that get in the way. And that's how I look at good and evil. Evil is the obstruction of that unconditional love. And in our world of duality that we perceive, that can exist too. So you could have beings out there, and I think this is probably the case, that want to help humanity and others that have a, are a force of trying to suppress us. And in some way that we could say that's so dark and, and terrible. Um, in another way, it's, it's a way to stimulate evolution because it's forcing us to really pick up our discernment and also look at ourselves to figure out where our own internal darkness lies so that we can transcend it and move to the next level. Well, it's like the human race. You've got, I mean, take a look at the, who, who's, who's the, who's, who represents the human race? Chinese person? A black person? An Irish person? Uh, I mean, everybody's, it's, it's it, amongst the human species, there's varieties. So obviously on interdimensional or alien worlds or whatever else, depending on the environment, conditions, growth, evolution. This is a, a 57 Heinz variety. It's going to be all over the place. That's, that would be the norm. It would be unexpected that everything would be the same out there. But let's go back to your premise, because you, in your synopsis of the book, it talks about this ongoing battle between good and evil, light and darkness, I guess. If you could kind of go into what you said in the book on that. Yeah. I, this is a a part of my worldview that's been evolving. I mean, everything has been evolving since I started this journey, but um, I didn't really talk about the good and evil battle as much in my prior work. And in this book, it's more central because when I talk about contact, one of the other fallacies, as I call it, 
to try to dispel it, are, are these notions that I sometimes hear from different researchers. And one end of the spectrum is these beings are totally benevolent. Some people believe that they're all good. They're here to help humanity. They're here to help us evolve. And others have the opposite perspective that they're all evil and it's all deception. And they're trying to enslave us. Where I come out on it is that there is a spectrum and there's both. And you ha might have some on the side of good that have evil mixed in. It's, it's kind of, it's nuanced. And I love the yin yang symbol because it, it illustrates the balance, I think, in the universe of this light dark. So in a near-death experience, for example, that's to me the clearest case of what appears to be benevolence because people will experience these beings of light. They describe it as unconditional love. They, they seem to have no doubt about it, that they feel completely comforted by this type of being, which can sometimes happen in other cases too, but the near-death experience seems to be really, really strong. So let's, let's say that's one end of the spectrum. And they'll even use the word God to describe it. Um, Anita Morjani, who famously recovered from her cancer after she had a near-death experience, she changed her mindset and her tumors disappeared. Amazing story. She described this God as not a being, but rather a state of being. Whereas other people will say that they encountered God, other people, and this is researched by Dr. Jeffrey Long, a radiation oncologist who looks at near-death experiences. He has a big database. He has a he looked at the, the cases in his database and found that many more people after their near-death experience believed in the concept of God than before their near-death experience. So there's something about this belief in a benevolent force that occurs. Um, but then there are many cases of encountering beings where the intent does not seem to be positive. And to me, that's not hard to believe because we can look at the world around us today and we clearly have criminals and we have people with psychopathic behavior. Why wouldn't that potentially exist on other planes as well with species who might be more advanced in certain ways, but that doesn't mean they're mature in other ways. And I, I do talk about some of this stuff in the book. I don't go too deep into it, but there are dark occult practices where people can try to summon demonic beings essentially by torturing people and this has been reported in the bible the aztecs used to sacrifice people to the gods that this has been reported for a long time and what some people who have survived this do report is that their actual physical beings appeared or something that they were able to visually see that was very dark and in some of the cases where there's sophistication involved those who in invoke this kind of black magic seem to try to attach these beings to people to spread the negativity. And I just mentioned this to show that there is a, there seems to be a balance here of a force that wants to help humanity, and there does seem to be a force that wants to suppress. And that's important to keep in mind, especially what I find in the spiritual community. There's a desire to focus exclusively on the light part of it, which I agree with in many ways. But there can be a danger in what's known as spiritual bypass to say, well, I don't want to look at the dark stuff. The problem with that is then it can fester and it can manipulate us in ways that we don't realize if we don't shine a light on it. And that to me is the, the spiritual dark versus light battle, which occurs not only within us, because I think it occurs within us individually, we see it projected out in the world as well. And I, I actually, now we get to the part where I return to my, uh, what I talked about in my earlier books, this idea that we're trying to evolve consciousness. Um, I, I think the mechanism of having this light dark battle is a way that we get there, but ultimately it's the same goal. And you always summarize it very well that it's about love and service. It, it's really simple, even though it's challenging. Uh, that's where I think we're all headed. And we have these forces that test us along the way, but we're ultimately trying to get there individually and collectively. Well, think about this. What's the holy book for the Christians, the Bible? What's the last part of the Bible? Revelations. There's this war between the dark angels, you know, like the Satan's angels, fallen angels, whatever they may be called, going against the good angels, right? And it sounds like it's a, a big battle. And so that's a part of our genetic uh, memory as a, as a species. I mean, we've always kind of kind of believe this thing it's kind of almost all the holy books have this big battle someplace good against evil you kind of wonder where the roots of that come from has it been from dreams and visions or is it, it it's really in our spiritual dna is it's one of those inedible truths that we're going to have to face or is it symbolic in some way like you know that battle in revelations is happening every day you know maybe right. it's happening every day right right yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe 
all of what you said is true to some degree. And I, I try to explore this in the book by looking at some of the ancient scriptures. And I do talk about uh, the Bible, Genesis, um, because there are different interpretations of it. I don't claim to know exactly what happened and whether those books are purely historical, whether they're purely mythical, but some would claim, and I reference the researcher Paul Wallace and Zechariah Sitchin, they, they look at the term Elohim, which is one of the terms used to denote the God creator in Genesis, and that's the Hebrew word Elohim. It is a plural term. <laughs> so some people say Elohim is a group of beings that came and were involved in the creation of, of man. And actually the pronouns that are used, sometimes they say um, the us, they wanna create the human like us. And I, I quote from the, the actual Hebrew translations. So some people would say, well, that's just uh, metaphorical to say that God is multifaceted. Others would say, no, no, no. These were advanced beings that came down. They genetically created Adam. Adam was the first man who was a genetic creation that had part of the the DNA of these uh, Elohim, Zechariah Sitchin calls them the Anunnaki from the Sumerian tablets that he claims to have uh, interpreted. So there was this notion of a, of a force that's intervening that is interesting to look at, but also the ancient uh, Gnostic Christian texts, they're called the Nag Hammadi scriptures. So these were found in a jar in the 1940s and were translated in, into English in the 1970s. So it's a relatively new document, but they come from third, fourth, fifth century AD, depending on who you talk to, maybe a little bit before that. And these were hidden in a jar because as the historians speculate, that these teachings were so heretical that the, the Christian church didn't want them involved. They didn't want them in the traditional biblical teaching, so they were suppressed. Now, if you believe that, to me, that makes them very interesting. And so I read these creation stories, which have since been translated, and one of them gets to what you're talking about, a potentially an ancient knowledge of this battle. Maybe it is a literal battle. And one of the stories, it's called On the Origin of the World. There are many st stories in these scriptures, one, like secret gospels, but this one in particular I talk about in addition to a few others. It, it tells the story of the origin of humanity. And I'll just summarize it. It's, it's fascinating to me. It starts off with the one, which I think for our philosophy, that, that aligns pretty well, that there's oneness. And from that oneness, there was diversity emerged. And there was essentially a daughter named Sophia that emerged from it. And she ended up having, what, this is the way the story goes, a son named Yaldabaoth without a father. And this was sort of a rogue son who then created his own world where there were these other beings, humans, that had the divine spark of the mother, Sophia, who came directly from this one source through luminaries. That was the genealogy. Um, so there were these human beings who had this divine spark but he created a matrix to keep them suppressed from it. So it's very much of this traditionally Christian or really many Western religions talk about this demonic uh, devilish force. It's, it's similar to that, that was intended to suppress humanity and humanity's uh, task really was to overcome that and to recognize that the power and the, the love was within them. But the matrix that they existed within was intentionally uh, made to suppress that and to keep humanity in ignorance. And some of this terminology, they, they talk about keeping humanity in ignorance and a state of confusion and to keep them distracted. That's the kind of stuff that came from, you know, second, third, fourth century AD. Well, we're still distracted. We're still ignorant. Nobody knows, nobody, you can't, in my mind, my mind, that's it. In my mind, I can't conceive any, any of these things. You can't get an answer with a human brain. You have to almost be brainless. <laughs> you got to be out of your mind or have no mind to understand these things better. But I, I, I don't think human species is, as long as we're wearing a body, are going to understand what's going on out there. When people come out and say, here's the truth, you know, I, I, if they form a religion, this is the truth. But geez, there's thousands of religions. Which one's the truth? Are they all just speaking what they feel from their heart, their opinion, their prejudice, their culture? Who knows? So, I'll go back to the one. To me, you can't go wrong if you're, if you're selling love. Love, compassion, service. It doesn't matter what your philosophy of life is. It doesn't matter what dogmas you believe in. Whatever dogmas you believe in doesn't change what really may be the truth, whatever that is. So you have to leave your life 
to please yourself for one thing, because you got to love yourself. Yeah. And, and when you love yourself and you believe that yourself is a part of everything else, there you go. Everything's loved, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is how I started the conversation with trying to set the context because I, I end up where you end up is this is all very interesting. I'm glad to know about it. I think it is important to know about our surroundings, but it doesn't change the truth of what our individual mission appears to be, which is love and service, spiritual evolution. We don't want to lose sight of that. Yeah. And that's the tension. Yeah. So, so when you started writing this book, did you indiv individually interview anybody that uh, had any of these phenomena happen to them? And what was your, what was your take on their experiences and their credibility? Well, thanks to the internet, there are so many of these interviews that are available all over the place. So I didn't go out and actually have one-on-one -on -one conversations for this book. Some of the conversations I had for my podcast series several years ago for my other book, which is related to this, um, there, there, there's relevance. So I did have discussions that related to some of these conversations, even including uh, encounters with other beings, encounters with aliens. And I then researched many of these interviews that I watched and read a lot. So in terms of the credibility, I'm glad you asked about that because I think there is a spectrum. It's really difficult as a researcher to know for sure because I, I, there is intentional manipulation. This has come out through government disclosure. Um, there are even some people who have, one case in particular, a man who was, now admits that he was giving out false information years ago about UFOs. So it's a very complex space. And that's why I use that Venn diagram analogy of trying to find the overlap because it's, it's really hard to tell sometimes. But I, I can sense with people when I talk to them or watch the interviews, there, there's a sincerity that's difficult to fake that they had something that happened to them in many cases that was profoundly impactful. And if you think about how crazy it makes them sound, it's not beneficial in many cases for people to talk about these things. It actually hurts their reputation. And I, I quote a man named Whitley Strieber, who's one of the more famous abductees. He wrote a book called Communion in, published in 1987, talking about his abduction experiences. And he was rectally probed, things that are now talked about much more commonly, but he had a traumatic experience. He, he writes about how he has essentially been just demeaned by everyone, even in his local town when they see him they'll say mean things to him or like spit in his groceries, he said, something like that. Um, so it, they're, they're, the incentive for that many people to want to speak out about something that is a taboo subject, I always keep that in mind. And for me, there's enough, there's enough credibility in at least some of the cases to make me think that something is happening here. And that thing is incredibly profound. I had an opportunity a uh, long time ago, I guess 2002. I was invited to uh, the Carter Center, President Jimmy Carter's center, and and he had his former, some of his former cabinet cabinet members and staff there. It was only about thirty people invited this function. Somehow I got an invitation. I was really, and, and a couple of my high school friends we got invitations there. Uh, but I sat down with him. And I go, I, I, I got to ask, I got to ask him about his UFO encounter, right? And. There's no reporters around. There's no secret agents. We're out in a little patio area. And he's pretty blunt. Yes. And he tells me the story about how he sees this thing in Georgia. And, and he was governor at the time. And all his staff and all the people that saw it as well, they all wanted him to shut up. Don't mention it. Don't talk about it. He gets to the White House. And he ends up at someplace along the line. He, he does research and things. And and he reads Ronald Reagan's story or talks to Ronald Reagan, I guess. I don't know if Reagan had to mention there or not. I guess he didn't. But he talked to Ronald Reagan when he was in. And Ronald Reagan was talking about when he was governor, UFOs flying along his uh, aircraft flying from Los Angeles to Sacramento. And him and his staff looking out the window and, and they're alien aircraft. There's this flying saucer UFO right outside the window. And no matter what, they're just right with him the whole time. And, and his people told him to shut up, too. It's interesting. But he told me, he says, he, I said, well, did you get a chance to look at the records? And he told me, he says, he says, I had the same problem that President Bill Clinton had. I said, what's that? They wouldn't access me. They wouldn't let me see them all. It was always, well, you know, I, but he never really got to see what he really wanted to see. And Bill Clinton complained about that as well. So what authority in the government is higher than the president? that you can withhold information on 
this subject or any subject, and the president doesn't have access to it, like that's that was a scary thing I learned from President Jimmy Carter. I'm going, wow. And I heard Bill Clinton mention that once in a speech or two. It's like off offhand remark, just oh, they wouldn't let me see it. And I'm going, wow. So we may know things, we meaning the government, civilization, the Russians, Americans, Chinese may know things, but we're not sharing things. What's your take on that? I mean, if you thought about that or yeah and it's, it's something i talk about in the book and it's interesting you mentioned jimmy carter because i i quote his uh, one of the attorneys that worked with him daniel sheehan who was a harvard attorney who talked about exactly what you said that he had to basically dig around to get information for jimmy carter because it was being hidden and yep. what appears to be the case it's difficult as someone who's not in the government to know exactly but what appears to be the case is that there are layers of secrecy and you have government officials that come in and out like a president, for example, but there are other structures that are much longer lasting that will withstand any individual tenure. And for whatever reason, because maybe because the government's so big, it's able, there, there are cover-ups and there are secret projects within secret projects. Some of this was disclosed with uh, Edward Snowden, or actually, excuse me, secret projects within projects that are disclosed. Uh, there's a book that I referenced by a man, uh, last name Sherman, called Above Black. And he wrote about this before Edward Snowden's documents came out. And he claims he was part of a, a, a project within the government communicating with gray aliens using his intuitive abilities. And he was told, he claims, that his mother was abducted back in the 60s, I believe. And he, for some purpose to, to you know, so there, there's been um, intervention with governments for a long time. That was the implication. And there are many other stories of this. So I'm, I'm very open to the idea that this knowledge exists within segments of the population, but it's very secretive. Well, well, my humble take on that is, if the government had information which would show that maybe Jesus isn't the only great being out there, maybe there's other civilizations following a different, would we release information that destroyed people's belief in their religion? It'd be chaos in this country. It'd be, that would be a real, Earth, literally earth-shaking event when we say, no, we're talking to these non-humans. Non yeah, they're made in God's image too. What's going on here? So there's a part of me suspects that somebody's making the, 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 the choice to, we don't want to interrupt people's beliefs. We want to keep people in this box of, because once we open this up, it, it changes society, changes what we believe to be true. I, yeah. That's a theme that I've come across as well, that it's in it's in our interest for this to be concealed. So yeah. there's, there's a lot that we don't know. That's the, the more I learn, the more I realize that I, there's just, I don't really know what's happening. But do you get into your book at all about how they constructed these great things in the past? Pyramids, things like that. I mean, I mean, there's actually, there, there was a technology someplace that was greater than we have now. Yeah. Okay. Like, how'd that happen? I only allude to it. This is something I've looked at and have not written much about, but this notion of advanced technologies that existed a long time ago, and perhaps before our history books tell us they should have, there's a lot of emerging evidence for that. The author Graham Hancock has been exploring these ideas. He wrote a book called Fingerprints of the Gods. Uh, this notion that there was advanced civilization on earth in a society that some call Atlantis and probably even beyond that Plato spoke of Atlantis. And I do mention that. And maybe these beings, there were beings involved that helped construct things that we can't explain very well. And it's interesting you mentioned the pyramids because I, I do talk about them in the context of UFOs. Um, a man named Jim Penniston, who was tasked in 1980 with looking at, looking at a craft that uh, was in the forest. It's called the Rendlesham Forest case. He ended up seeing this craft and touched it. And it's a pretty amazing story. Um, he then had this flash of zeros and ones in his mind. And when he went to bed that night, he couldn't sleep because the zeros and ones kept coming in his mind after he touched his craft. And he decided to just write it down in a journal. And it was 16 pages of zeros and ones that he left there. Years later, he was on the set of a, of a documentary or something like that, talking about the, his UFO encounter, not thinking about the zeros and ones, and was flipping through his old journal. And someone, one of the other journalists on the set said, wait, stop. I saw you flip through a bunch of zeros and ones. That's binary code. Yeah. 
we, we need to decode that. So they had someone decode it. And now he's written a book that's nearly 700 pages, came out a few years ago with a co-author describing his experiences in detail and decoding those zeros and ones. And one of the things that comes up is the coordinates of sacred sites around the world, including many of the pyramids around the world. Why? <laughs> so what, what's going on there? Why was that transmitted to him? What were these pyramids? Who really built them? What kinds of technology and what's the significance of them? I don't know. Well, well, think about this. You go to Central America, pyramids. Go to South America, pyramids. Okay, they could transfer. Okay. Go to Egypt, there's pyramids. We even got pyramids that are mounds that are kind of buried in North America. Like, you know, there might have been a pyramid. There's pyramids are all over the place. It's like, what is it about that ge ge uh, geographic, what's the word I'm looking for? That, that shape, right? Yes. What, what is it about this pyramid? Is, is Why would they shape? They could have built a square box and go, but they all went to three-sided or whatever. It was three-sided pyramids, right? What, why? What's, is there power there? Is there energy there? I know New Agers are always, you know, they building pyramids and stuff, you know, and you sit under them. But there's got to be something there if all these different cultures. I thought about this one day. Uh, I was watching a movie and they discovered this new civilization in the Malaysian jungle or someplace, you know, in the boonies. And I'm going, it's interesting that we discover these ancient tribes and stuff, no matter how far back you go in history or what place, every tribe, every culture has singing, drums, stringed instrument, maybe even something they blow. Every one of them knows how to laugh. Every one of them knows how to cry. Who taught people music? I mean, just take something so really simple. All these cultures developing independently around the globe, the world, right? And yet music grew in all these places without, you know, contacting other people and other cultures, quote unquote, supposedly. But they all grew a form and a culture of music. Interesting. I'm just, it's, it's kind of like, uh, Thomas Edison invents uh, the light bulb, whether he did or not. I don't know. His, his company did. He used everybody else. But it's interesting when he's doing that, people in Russia, people in Germany, people all over the world are doing the same thing. It's a big rush to who's going to get it patent, right? All getting the same flow of information and inspiration. Yeah. Well, I think there's something with frequencies that I don't fully understand. And maybe that's where sound and music comes in and light. These are all forms of frequency that maybe have a power beyond what our scientific community seems to understand. And maybe there's something about geometry that harnesses that. I don't fully understand it. And then you mentioned creativity, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about too, because where does where do these ideas come from and how are ideas, similar ideas, getting to different places is it that we are that the thoughts are being implanted almost telepathically by these interdimensional beings that we don't see uh, i wonder that I and mean, I, I want i wonder about that because to me the brain and this is what i write about in my first book and end upside down thinking is not the producer of our consciousness but rather it's like an antenna receiver transmitter filtering mechanism and if we think about it at like an antenna for a second it could be receiving all kinds of stuff and they, those appear as thoughts in our mind. Maybe that's where creativity comes from. It's coming from this broader consciousness or maybe other beings within the consciousness, why they're being implanted. That is a bigger question, um, but I don't know. Well, if I remember right, that, I, cause I read too much stuff it, in your, in your book, I think you, in your first book on conscious, did you talk about how monkeys in Japan and some Island someplace else, developed skills of how to use a stick or something at the same time. Was that in your book? Is that where I read that? I didn't write about it, but I have heard about that. Yeah. yeah. The species of this animal develops it thousands of miles away, remote, no way they could talk to each other. And yet this other group of monkeys is discovering the same thing and using sticks as tools. It's like, wow. So to get back to the one consciousness of your first book, I think it all ties together. All right, let's talk about a couple of things. One, I want people to know how to get your book. Where's it at and how do they get it? And you'll send me a link for the, the, that, I hope. Sure. So the book, again, is called An End to Upside Down Contact. It's my fourth book. It's available on Amazon. 
And currently it's in paperback and Kindle. And in August of 2022, it will be available in Audible form as well. And all my books are available as hard copies, Kindle and Audible. All right. What's your website? My website is my name, M-A-R-K-G-O-B-E-R.com. Okay. Now that COVID is over, I'm assuming that you, it, by the end of summer, you're probably going to start going out and, and giving talks, lectures. Are you available? What's your schedule? Is there anything anybody publicly can go see or meet you? As of now, my uh, schedule is primarily remote. So doing interviews like this, radio shows, podcasts, I do hope to get out there more often, but currently they're not scheduled. If I do schedule them, I will uh, announce them on my mailing list. So at my website, markgober.com, you can just enter your email address and I give announcements on, on latest events. So I'll be sure to announce it there and also on social media. Well, you know, when this thing gets a little safer out there, be it 2023 or whatever, I plan on having a little presentation. I don't know what, not a workshop, not a seminar, more of a, a gathering of, of creative thinking people uh, speaking about near death experiences, speaking like you are about consciousness and UFOs, myself, some other people, maybe having four or five speakers someplace like in the San Francisco Bay Area or Sedona or someplace around the country. So I invite you to that prematurely because I don't have any plans. You. So you can, you can come join me and we can always do another, another uh, podcast and, and share. Uh, leave us with what, what did you learn new when you did this book or what reinforced your thinking or in truth, when you did the book, did you come with more questions than you had answers mm. or all the above? Yeah, all the above in different ways. So a few things, a few responses. One of the things that surprised me and probably gave me the impetus to, to write the book is the extent of the interaction between these beings and our society. I always had the sense that we were being interacted with, but I didn't realize how potentially significant it was. Now I think it's incredibly central to our history and our current events is it's multidimensional, multi-species. That is really critical. And there's one thing that we haven't talked about yet that I want to mention, because once I knew I was going to write the book, I kind of, I always have an outline and I basically know what the book is going to be before I decide to write it. Cause I've done the research. It's just a matter of getting it on paper, but there was something that came up in the process of writing that I didn't fully expect. And it relates to the psychedelic DMT. And there's a book by Rick Strassman from the University of New Mexico, a medical doctor, who has done one of the few studies on this psychedelic because it's an illegal drug. So it's very hard to get these things approved. And he was looking at things like you know blood pressure, looking at very basic physiological metrics when you uh, give the person DMT intravenously, dimethyltryptamine. It's known as a very psychedelic that's produced naturally by the body actually. And it's found in nature, but it usually decomposes very quickly. So you don't, we're not having psychedelic experiences all the time. If you give it an intravenous injection, you're creating something that the body doesn't naturally do. And it puts people into this other world. And I mention it in the context of these other beings, because what Rick Strassman, Rick Strassman's volunteers were talking about was encounters with other beings. And he didn't expect that. He ended up shutting down the study because he, it was too much for him that he was subjecting people to this. And that's not what his intent was. And interestingly, what these people describe sometimes is identical to what you hear in alien abductions. They were being probed. They were being injected by these beings. They were describing similar species, insectoid beings, reptilian beings, et cetera. And to me, that was fascinating because it reinforces the idea that this phenomenon appears to be at least partially in consciousness because the person's body, when they're being injected with DMT, they're in the hospital or in the room with the researchers, and yet their consciousness is having these intense experiences somewhere else. And that is consistent with the abduction research where sometimes the person's body is missing, but other times they appear not to be missing. And John Mack from Harvard explored that as well. So that, that was really, it helped reinforce for me um, it's also the credibility of this phenomenon that it can appear in so many different places and from, from different researchers. And in terms of where I land now, having looked at all of it, um, I, I feel like I, I really don't, I don't have a great grasp on the phenomenon. <laughs> I feel like I've looked at it, but it's, it's this slippery kind of thing. That's not purely physical. Even those who have had experiences, they'll describe a state that they 
they say is like a dream, but they'll say, well, it's not like a dream. I just can't explain to you what it's like. It's almost a different state of consciousness. So as a researcher, it's very difficult to, to handle something like that. So I, I feel a great conviction that these beings exist. There's a spectrum of good evil. They're intervening. It's not fringe. This is very central. But I also feel like there's a lot that I don't know. So what I'm hoping to do for my audience, which ultimately I'm, I'm doing it for myself to start, uh, it's my curiosity for myself, and then I want to share it with people. I want, I want to give people a platform to be able to at least start thinking about the universe that we inhabit. And it leads to new ways of thinking about life. To me, and it's been a very positive experience, and I hope to, to transmit that to others. I, I want to congratulate you on your continuing voyage of the consciousness and meaning of life, because basically all your books, even though they don't look like they're, it's all about that, thus the upside down, whatever it happens to be that you're exploring. And again, the book is an end upside down contact, and it should be available on Amazon and, and some, some bookstores. You got to realize the world is getting short on bookstores. There's not that many anymore. Yeah. Amazon really is the best place uh, to, to get uh to get a book because you can get it at order, it's done, boom, there it is. Unfortunately, I used to love bookstores and they're just like dinosaurs coming extinct. So blessings and peace to you, my friend, Mark, and we will talk after this. And uh, for those people out there, I invite you to buy the book. I invite you to read it. I invite you to share this video with others. And we don't expect anybody watching this to accept 100% face value of anything that we said or had this conversation because we don't even know what's the truth. Nobody really knows what the truth is. Can't guarantee it. So this is not about opinions. This is about a presentation today that was, here's what we looked at. Here's what we've explored. Here's the questions that we got. And I don't know if anybody could give you the real answers on this. Is life out there? Yeah. Got to ask yourself time, sometime though, is there any intelligence on the earth? <laughs> <laughs> for watching the news I, is do we have an intelligence here anyway uh blessings and peace to you mark and i appreciate you coming on here and god bless